Harvard Business School and um, I, uh, in between the years, I actually couldn't get a summer job. I, I tried, I interviewed, you know, firstly, the, when you're a student visa in those years, they, they didn't really want to interview you. So there were very few opportunities that I didn't get a summer job. And I had to come back to India for my sister's wedding. So I had, uh, so I was coming back to India for, for a month. And then my roommate's father, he was the president of a company that made jams and jellies in upstate New York. So he said to me, uh, why don't you come? We're having a lot of problems with uh, our inventory system and production system. So maybe you can help us think through that. So after, after that, I went, went to upstate New York. It was a great offer. He uh, offered to stay at his place. So I had no costs and, uh, you know, I would go into the factory with him and try to solve this problem. Well, it was an interesting problem because uh, they were a private label manufacturer of jams and jellies. I don't know whether all of you understand what that means is that there are a lot of grocery chains in, in the US, Stop and Shop, uh, Whole Food, whatever, whatever. They all have their private label. If they, they make something, uh, they will offer you products with their own label on it, on private label. And they were a private label manufacturer. They were not a Smuckers, which was a branded jam jellies manufacturer. So they had roughly 300 different chains, food retailing chains, who were their customers. And they had about 70 different flavors. I never understood that there were that many flavors of jam and jellies. I mean, you would be surprised. I mean, what makes a strawberry and peach and you know apple and all that. But there is currant and there is. I mean, there, there's a whole variety of um, you know jams and jellies. There were 70 different flavors of jams and jellies, and they also came in three sizes. You know, the six ounce, 12 ounce, or 32 ounce, or whatever. That sizes was so they came in three sizes now you can think about it 300 customers three sizes 70 flavors you have a huge number of SKUs so they used to make these number of SKUs and inventory them and they could never really guess they would forecast demand because the service was important when the orders came in you have to be supplied within a very short period of time, less than a week. So they would, they would have a huge warehouse where they would store, store all this. And often they were wrong. They would predict that they would sell, uh, you know, 100 of the, you know, strawberry of stop and shop and of eight ounce sizes. And then suddenly an order would come for 500 and they would have to, make that to satisfy that. There were two large production lines and, and it's a complicated process. It's one continuous production line. Uh, they cook the jam and jellies and then they go and in the end package it. So every time they had to stop the production line to make a new flavor, new size, it was quite a lot of costs where they had to stop the thing and change the flavor and all that. So, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time observing this, what they did. And uh, I came up with the idea saying, why do you have to stock um, all these SKUs? Why don't we uh, break the production line in producing the jam or jelly? And in packaging the jam and jelly, uh, fill the fill the bottles, but don't label them, and have a completely different labeling line, so that according to demand, you store a blank jar without a label of let's say strawberry jam of eight ounces, and whichever chain orders, you slap in their label to whatever amount that is ordered. So that was a, I'm surprised they hadn't thought of that. It was a kind of a straightforward, you know, solution. That was one part of it. 
The other part of it was in the production side. I said, you know, you know the roughly the demand. You know that, you know, strawberry is the most uh, common flavor. So you know how many how many pounds of strawberry jam you sell in, in, in a month. Let's say. So I said, why don't you run strawberry continuously for three days? Because it's the it's ten percent of your demand is strawberry. So just run strawberry, no changes, no stopping the line, just fill it, and you know you what we did is we did. I developed a 28-day cycle where each of these flavors would be made, but they would be made together. So three days for strawberry, two days for apple, and, and etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in the end, they would be half a day for you know some exotic flavor or one third, two hours for this, etc. And then I did one other thing. I said they had to wash the line. Once you make strawberry jam, if you want to make apple jam, then next you have to wash the lye, and then you have to make apple jam. So I said, why do you do that? Why don't you just go from the lighter flavor to the darker flavor, and just flush the lye? So if you made apple jam first, okay, then you're making strawberry jam, and, and you run start running strawberry, and for the first, I don't know. Maybe 200 pounds. You just throw the product away because it's a mixture of apple and strawberry. But you didn't stop the line. You didn't stop it for two hours to do the changeover and washing and this and that. Because they all, you know, it's a it's a completely sanitized line, so you don't have to worry about it. Anyway, so this uh, I I drew up a. Um, a, a schedule. It was a 20-day, 28-day cycle. It's it handwritten by me to the production guy, and he put it down, booked the schedule in his desk, in front of his desk. And the interesting thing was, I went back. They were friends of mine. This was my father of the best friend of mine, and I went back to their home 10 years later. And he said, "Come on, let's go to the plant." And I went there, and in my handwriting. Very brown. That piece of paper was stuck on his wall. They booked the schedule, and they were still running the same schedule because there was no change really in the fundamental demand of, uh, you know, production 